morning is 1st Timothy chapter 3 and we're looking at verses 14 to 16 a sermon title conduct worthy of king and cause conduct worthy of king and cause and this is part two in our series here in verses 14 to 16 and I want to read this passage to you before we get into the passage itself these things the Bible says I write to you though I hope to come to you shortly but if I am delayed I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God which is the church of the living God the pillar and ground of the truth and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory. But Paul here in 1 Timothy is writing an instructive and a corrective letter to the church at Ephesus through Timothy, but specifically to the church. In these simple but profound verses in chapter 3, Paul takes a brief moment, a pause, if you will, to put his correction and his instruction here in 1 Timothy in perspective, to put it in its right context. As we've talked about, sometimes correction can be difficult. It's often painful. And when in, we are in our pride, we don't tend to take it overly well. For that reason, it is often important to remind ourselves of both the goodness of God in correction, but also in the necessity of godly correction. Paul here is correcting and he's instructing this church in Ephesus through this first letter to Timothy, and in this, he corrects and instructs us. And we need to humbly take that instruction and take that correction. Paul here is after right conduct in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. There are those in Ephesus who are teaching wrong doctrine and they need to be corrected. There are those involving themselves in needless disputes and they need correction. We see that in chapter 1. There are those giving themselves to meaningless fables, endless genealogies, idle talk, vain janglings. We also see that in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and they need correction. There are those who are misusing the law of God, who don't understand it. They twist it to their own destruction. They need correction. There are those who have strayed from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. They've strayed from holy living and right conduct, which would mark them as members of the house of God, the church of the living God, and they need correction. There are those who are not serving and not obeying the Lord. There are those who have suffered shipwreck of their faith, and in suffering shipwreck of their faith, they're leading down others down the same path. There are men, in chapter 2, who are contentious in their prayers. There are women there who are rebellious to authority, immodest in their dress, and pretentious. There are women who are forsaking their God-given roles in the family. And there were unqualified leaders, unqualified deacons in place, two of which, Hymenaeus and Alexander, have already been put out of the church. The church needs correction. Our church needs correction. You and I need correction. Godly correction is how we grow in Christ. But this is a lot to take in. Turning this ship is not a small undertaking. Oftentimes, turning our own Christian lives around is not a small or a light undertaking. Sometimes it takes great effort, diligent effort, to turn the ship around. Paul, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, here in these verses, is calling for a right response to that correction. We have correction given in chapters 1 through 3. We have correction coming in chapters 4 through 6. And here is just a brief pause to get our act together, to get our minds right about this correction, and to engender, if you will, a right response to the correction that's going on here. He's calling for a right response, which is right conduct. That's right living. That's holy living. That's obedience to the Word of God. That you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. Now, you know from experience, don't you, that a correct response to correction often takes sacrifice on your part. It takes a tough redirecting sometimes of resources of time. Sometimes it takes a change of schedule. It takes a change of habits. It takes a redirecting of energy, of focus. Most importantly, it takes a change of thinking, a change of judgment, a change of behavior. It takes genuine repentance, and genuine repentance will result in godly fruit, right conduct. And for that reason, with all this correction that is necessary and needed, well, the correction, it's important that we remind ourselves often of why we do what we do. Why are you here? What are we doing? What are we all about? What are the reasons that we should heed the correction? Why are these things important? And Scripture regularly, praise the Lord, and often gives the greatest reasons why that are possibly imaginable, right? The greatest reasons why. Why do you die to self? 
and forsake your life in this world? Why do you count all things that were once gained to you, why do you now count them as loss? Why do you now count them as rubbish? Why do you strive to put aside worldly priorities for heavenly ones? Maybe you've forgotten why, and you don't strive as hard as you once did, or don't strive as hard as you should to put away worldly things and to remind yourself of heavenly ones. Why do you endure the persecution? Why do you bear the reproach? Why do you evangelize? Why do you go downtown? Why do you listen to the scoffers? Why do you fight to endure? Why do you wage war against sin? Why do you hate that sin that you once loved? Why are you trying desperately to put off the old man and put off the new man? Why do you pray? Why do you devote yourself to the Word of God? Why do you devote yourself to serving others? Why are you submitting? Why are you following the Lord at great cost to yourself? Why are you here? From your heart, can you give this answer from Scripture? For the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. Is that the answer from your heart? And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. It's not the doing of these things that earn you Christ. It's not the doing of these things that earn you righteousness. But it's the goal of the Christian life. It's the prize that we press for that motivates us. And Paul goes on to say, not that I've already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, he says, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That is a glorious why, isn't it? It's a glorious reason. We should be all about that reason. Willing to take correction. Willing to take instruction. Willing to be conformed into the image of his son. Let me give you another reason. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. There are many reasons given throughout scripture. Glorious reasons. And often we need to just pause. As Paul does here. Just pause. Take a moment. To examine those reasons. To hold them up as beautiful portraits before our eyes that we can look to, that we can rest on, rely in to press us forward in the work that we've been called to do. Here, another reason in chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 3. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3. For consider him, Christ, who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You become weary in the work, weary in the labor. Listen, your life, your life is a short-term mission trip. This life is passing away. Unless you become weary in this life and doing the work of the Lord, look to Christ. He endured such hostility from sinners against himself. You've got his example. Verse 4, you've not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. That chastening there is correction. That chastening is discipline. That chastening is discipline, instruction from the Lord. Nor be discouraged, it goes on to say, when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, these he chastens, and he scourges every son whom he receives. And that word scourging there reminds us of Christ and Christ's suffering uh, the hands of wicked men, but that scourging from our loving Heavenly Father is a blessed grace to us. That's His discipline, His correction, His rebuke. That scourging is a good thing. We need to respond to that well. Respond to that with obedience. Respond to that with faith in Him. Respond with right conduct. Because verse 7, it says, if you endure that chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are 
illegitimate and not sons. It's interesting there, which all, all Christians have become partakers of chastening. When you're a sin, do you feel the weight of God's hand on you in your sin? Do you suffer consequences of that sin? Do you experience the chastening, scourging, disciplining, correcting hand of God in your life? That's a grace of God. If you have no chastening, no discipline, you're not in Christ. It's all who are partakers of that. If you're not partakers of that, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Verse 9, furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for what? For our profit, for our good. He works all things together for our good, including our discipline, our correction, our chastening that we may be partakers of his holiness. And if you're a Christian here today, that is the great desire of your heart is to be a partaker of his holiness, to live pleasing in God's sight. You hunger and you thirst for righteousness. If that hungering and thirsting for righteousness isn't there, you're not in Christ. That's part and parcel with a new creation. You're going to hunger and thirst for holiness, for righteousness. Listen to what it says in verse 11. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. And all God's people said, amen. Nevertheless, it's the fruit of that. This is, it's taking, taking your medicine, right? It's the fruit of that. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And as much as that chastening may be painful, we say, Lord, with the saints, please, please grow me, please mature me. Please, Lord, correct me where I'm wrong. God, bring the chastening. Now, we want to be conformed in the image of his son. We want to be like Christ. Why must you constantly check your priorities and conduct to make sure that you are walking worthy of the calling with which he's called us? This is conduct that is worthy of our king and worthy of his cause. This is that conduct which is appropriate considering that you belong. If you're in Christ, you belong to the house of of God, the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. That Paul gives several more reasons. We've seen these, but Paul gives several more reasons back in 1 Timothy chapter 3, right here in verses 15 to 16. These verses, again, represent a restatement of a grand purpose. They are re-clarifying values. They're restating why it's important to respond to this correction with right conduct, to get everyone on the same page again, to rally the troops, this is a time for us to remember. It's a time for us to contemplate. A time for us to reaffirm what we are to know and how we are to live. This is a time to reflect on the big whys, the big reasons that drive the Christian life. Now, last week, we looked at what our response to that biblical correction should be. So today, let's look at Paul's reasons. Paul gives reasons here in verse 15. And it's interesting, the reasons that Paul gives. We look first at our response here in verse 15, we see some reasons. Verse 15. But if I am delayed, Paul writes, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. That is a simple but a profound statement laden with truth and laden with reason for why we should respond with right conduct. There are many reasons given in Scripture that should motivate us to take correction from the Word of God. But the reasons that Paul gives here in verse 15 are wrapped up or contained in our understanding of the church. Our understanding of what the church is, its identity and its nature, but also our place in the church and what that means. Now think about it for a moment. A proper understanding of the church and all that that entails will inform in you a sense of right responsibility that you have to the church. A right understanding of the church will inform a right sense of responsibility in you to the church. And that should, if you're a Christian, respond in right conduct. It all starts here with an understanding of the church. Inevitably, that's going to lead to proper worship. We'll see that when we get to verse 16. Proper conduct, proper worship. But first, now here in verse 15, Paul describes in just these few words here the identity of the church first as the house of God. Now the imagery here is of a building. 
But the building is a metaphor, and it's a metaphor for the family of God, the people of God. The church isn't the brick and mortar. It's you. <laughs> it's you individually. It's us corporately that make up the people of God, that make up God's body, the church. Therefore, this is not about the behavior that you're to have when you come into the church building. This is about the behavior, the conduct that you are to have because you are the church, because you are the people of God. Your identity as a member of God's family should inform how you respond with right conduct, okay? This letter to Timothy points to the conduct that is proper for a member of God's family, for the people of God. And this is such a simple statement, house of God. But if you stop to ponder this, it has tremendous impact on your life. What is the church, the house of God? The church is that blessed assembly, the glorious bride of Christ who has been called out and gathered together by God himself. They are a ransomed and redeemed people, not merely rescued out of Egypt, but rescued out of sin, rescued out of bondage, rescued out of wickedness, rescued out of this world. They are a people purchased by Christ's own blood, the life of God in the flesh shed for sinners, and they, they are set apart for his own worship and his praise. They are a people called by God, born again by God, not constituted of the will or decisions of men. They are called forth by God. In light of their hopeless depravity, the church are the trophies of God's infinite mercy and God's infinite grace, saved from sin, saved from death, saved from the wrath of God to reflect God's own infinite immutable and incorruptible glory. And they're to do that by living changed lives and worshiping him in spirit and in truth. The house of God in every way that communicates that we are his people, that we are owned by him, that we belong to him, we belong to God. And we're not his because we are worthy, but we're his because he chose us. We're here merely by virtue that he chose to love us. We love him because he first loves us. We draw near to him because he first draws near to us. And if you think about it, God chose the children of Israel, not because they were more in number than any other people, for they were the least of all peoples, it says, but because the Lord chose to love them. He chose them to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all peoples. In similar fashion, God foreloves the precious called out ones of the church, the assembly of God. Those whom he foreknows, he predestines to be conformed to the image of his son. Those whom he predestines, he calls to himself. He justifies and he glorifies. And not at all because he chose us in Christ from before the foundation of the world. Not because many are wise according to the flesh. Not because many are mighty. Not because many are noble. Our value as a church, as a body, you individually, is not in any of that. But simply your value is in the fact that God chose to set his love on you. Because Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. John 15, 16. Christ says that we did not choose him but that he chose us and appointed us that we should go and bear fruit. It begins in the Old Testament with a promise. It's the promise of the new covenant. God says in Jeremiah 31, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. That's the church, the people of God. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. The church is made up of those people that God has redeemed to himself, saved from sin, redeemed, rescued. Ezekiel 36, God says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and I will give you a humble heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. You will keep my judgments and do them. He goes on to say, and again, a reference to the new covenant in Hosea chapter 2. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you shall know the Lord. 
And in glorious promise, he goes on to say, I'll have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. Then I will say to those who were not my people, you are my people. And they shall say, you are my God. We're speaking of the Gentiles there. And then in Luke chapter 22, Christ, sitting at the table, took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. He purchases this new covenant with his own blood. He enters into covenant with us. He draws himself to us, binds us to him in covenant with him. And that is for the Gentiles. Ephesians 2 says that God has now called to himself those who were not his people, and he says to them, you are my people. He has broken down the middle wall of separation between those who are afar off and those who are near, between Jews and Gentiles, the Gentiles being far off, the Jews being near, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, one body, one church made up of the redeemed, redeemed Jews, redeemed Gentiles, so that he could reconcile both to himself in one body through the cross. And that is the church. He came and preached peace to us who were afar off, and to those who are near, for through him, Christ, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now, therefore, we're no longer strangers, aliens, we're no longer foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the house of God, the church of the living God, the ground and pillar, pillar and ground of the truth. Redeemed Jews and redeemed Gentiles, men and women from every trunk, tongue, every tribe, every nation, God's purchased possession God's family, the congregation of saints, the city of the living God, the general assembly of the firstborn, the golden lampstands, God's building, God's field, the bride of Christ, the temple of the living God, God's vineyard, the fold of Christ, the flock of God, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's the church. Out of darkness into light. You were once not a people, destined for destruction, but now you are the people of God. You had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. God says, I will be their God, and they will be my people. This is the house of God, the family of God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Are you a member of this household Where is your identity this morning? Where are you wrapped up? Are you in the house of God, the family of God, the people of God, the church of God, the church of the living God? Or are you still yet a part of this world that is passing away? It is the most important distinction that you will ever make. Where are you at? Are you sons of God or sons of disobedience? Of your father God or of your father the devil? The most important distinction you will ever make. Are you among the blood-bought saints of the living God? And how do you know? How do you know? Is it based on the sincerity of your deceitful heart? Is it based on some experience? Is it based on some decision that out of the will of your own wicked heart that you somehow made? No. If you're in that people, if you're in that assembly, it's because God chose to set his love on you. He chose to be merciful, chose to be gracious. How is that church formed? How are these, this people, this assembly, gathered together out of darkness into life, gathered from death to eternal life? How are they formed? How are God's people made righteous in order to be standing before God one day without spot or wrinkle, without blemish? It's because God has risen a Savior. God has risen a Savior. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, 700 years before the birth of Jesus Christ, the Bible says, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, meaning God with us. 700 years later, in Luke chapter 2, verse 11, For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, For God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, 
that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I love this passage in Romans chapter 5. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Will you admit today that you are ungodly outside of Christ? For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Through your own works? No. Through your external expressions of religion? No. Through going to church? No. Through your own work? No. It is through him, through Christ, through Christ alone. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Reconciled to God. That's the people of God. Those who are reconciled. If you're outside of the house of God, the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth, you are enemies of God by your wicked works. The house of God, the church of the living God, is made up of those who are redeemed from ungodliness. They have been reconciled to God. They have put to death the enmity that exists between them. They are reconciled. They're justified. However, this Savior that has been risen is also the head of the church, the head of this body, and he is king and he is judge. In Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, 500 years before the birth of Christ, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. 500 years later in Matthew chapter 21, they brought the donkey and the colt, they laid their clothes on them and set Jesus on them, and a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Revelation chapter 7, verse 14. He is Lord of lords and king of kings, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. That's what it means to be in the church. That's the identity of the church. It is those that are with him, those who are called, those who are chosen, and those who are faithful. That is the church. Are you faithful? Are you in the church? Are you among his people? Revelation 19, verse 16, And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. As king, as head of the church, he is to be submitted to. He is to be followed by faith with the right conduct that is worthy of our king and worthy of his cause. In Revelation 20, it depicts Christ as judge. And I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one, according to his works." Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. What will your book say when it is opened? What is written there? Have you thought about it? Are you among the people of God? Is your name before the foundation of the world written in the Lamb's book of life? When the Lord opens the book of your life, what will he see? Jude says that Christ, this head of the church, he's going to come back to judge. The Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Are you ungodly? Or are you one of those that will come with the Lord, one of the ten thousands of his saints, when you stand before Christ and the book of your life is opened, what will it say? Will it say liar? Yes. 
Will it say murderer as a result of anger in your heart? Maybe as a result of condoning or committing abortion? Yes. Will it say thief? Yes. Rob time at work. Rob time for family. Rob time. Rob tithes from God. Will it say grumbler? Yes. Will it say complainer? Yes. Will it say idolater? Yes, it will. Will your book say adulterer? Yes, it will. Lust in the heart or adultery. Will your book say covetous? Yes. Will it say flatterer? Disobedient to parents? Unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful? Yes. Will it say sexually immoral? Will it say unclean? Will it say envious? Will it say divisive? Yes. Will it say drunkard, reviler, hater? Will it say selfish ambition? Will it say hypocrite? Yes. Will it say that you have failed every day with every breath that you've taken to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength? Yes, it will. Apart from Christ, you are ungodly. You are an enemy of God by your wicked works. Will you admit it? Will you admit it? You've committed these crimes against God and you are guilty. If you were to die this instant apart from Christ, you would suffer eternal damnation, eternal condemnation, eternal torment, eternal punishment in hell where the worm does not die and the fire is never quenched. What will you do? You are guilty. What will you do? Asking for forgiveness is not enough. There is a penalty that must be paid. There's the perfect justice of God that must be satisfied. His perfect justice must be upheld. Trying to be a good person is not going to get you there. It's not enough. Your good works are as filthy rags. The Bible says you're to be perfect. You're to be holy, God says, as I am holy. And without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Going to church isn't enough. As an enemy of God, by your wicked works, your worship outside of faith in Christ is an abomination to God, is worthless, is disgusting, is despicable before God. Face it, you are in your sin and you cannot change yourself. You cannot clean yourself. You cannot forgive yourself. You cannot pardon yourself. And you cannot escape the perfect justice of God. You can do nothing Think about it for a moment. You have all the resources in the world available to you. You have a Bible in your hands. You have God's words of life, and most of the time it sits there collecting dust on your shelf because you have no devotion in your heart to study or to read the Word of God. The Bible says that you are to be perfect, and yet you've lived a lifetime of sin. Despite how hard you try, you're still angry. Despite how hard you try, you're still lustful. Despite how hard you try, you're still a complainer. You're still a grumbler. You go to church and yet your life is empty. It's hollow. It's shallow. You're depressed. You don't see any meaning of this life. You feel the weight of your sin bearing down on you. You are miserable in your marriage. You're miserable in your work. You're miserable in your school. You're miserable in your family. You have no real hope. You are miserable, and you'll always be miserable until you turn to Christ. Do you see that outside of Christ, your life is completely worthless, and then you die? Ephesians says that you are a stranger to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But Ephesians, in that very same passage says that Christ can become your peace. That you can be made right with a holy God. That you can be brought near to Christ by His blood. The church, the house of God, is formed by Christ who redeems His people from this miserable state. Jesus has come into the world as light so that whoever believes in him may not remain in darkness. 
as we looked at in 1 Timothy, Jesus has come into the world to save sinners. Being God in the flesh, the head of the church, Jesus Christ was tempted in every respect as we are and was without sin. He lived a sinless, perfect life. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. Being perfect, Christ then became the source of salvation. He, being perfect, was qualified them to offer himself as a sacrifice to die in your place. And God did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. That in redeeming his own special people, the Bible says that God was pleased to crush him. And Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. The righteous for the unrighteous, the just for the unjust, to stand in your place as the only acceptable substitute. Taking our penalty, he suffers. He bears the wrath of God, the full wrath of God, and satisfies the perfect justice of God. He died in your place when you are the one that deserves to die. You owe a debt you cannot pay. And he paid a debt he did not owe. He bears your guilt if you were to be saved, it was necessary for Christ to suffer and then to be raised from the dead for you. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through Him believe in God, who raised Him from the dead and gave Him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. He was manifested in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and then ascended and was received up in glory where he is even now at the right hand of God making intercession for his own. And he's coming back. He's coming back. Will he even find faith on the earth? Will he find faith in you? Will he find you repenting? Will he find you trusting in his promises? Will he find you serving his cause? Will he find you with right conduct in the house of God? Will he find you embracing all that it means to be his own? It is this Jesus, the king, the judge, the head of the church, that calls out to you now. Matthew 11, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In Revelation 22, the Spirit and the bride say, Come. Let him who hears say, Come. Let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. You rebel, come. You sinner, come. If you're weary under the weight of your sin, Come, if you've had enough with this wicked world, come. If you want to forsake that life that you've made a complete wreck of, come. And Christ will in no wise cast you out. The call to salvation in Christ is a call to repent, to turn from your sin, to turn from your own foolish, wicked works, to turn from your selfish ambition, to turn from living life for yourself, and to put your faith and trust and reliance alone in Christ. And Christ will forgive you of your sins. He will wash you clean. He will pardon you, forgive you, cleanse you. Though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be as white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, they'll be as wool. This is the identity of the church. The church is those that have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Those who have submitted themselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, those who have placed faith and faith alone in Christ and Christ alone to save them, who don't trust in their works, but all their hope, all their faith is in Christ. They hope in Him for eternal life. These are those who have been given, who have given themselves entirely to serve Him. Not those who are half-hearted, not those who are carnal, not those who are lukewarm, but those who are sold out 
those who love Christ, those who are devoted to his word and give evidence of that faith by obeying him. It's those that once Christ has redeemed them to himself and bound them to himself, it is those that express that new identity in a changed life. Express that new identity by living holy lives before God. And that's one aspect of the identity of the church. Those that have been redeemed, the redeemed people of God. But it's interesting here in verse 15 that Paul gives a second aspect of this identity. And that's seen in the clause there, the phrase, the church of the living God. The church of the living God. Those who are in the house of God, the church of the living God, living here contrasts the living God, the one true and living God, with the deadness and falseness of idols. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, it says how you turned to God from those dead false idols who are nothing, to serve the living and true God. Living here also used to emphasize that it is to be a vibrant, healthy, living, fervent, active, dynamic body, alive, so to speak, with the very presence of God. And this imagery here is given of God's people as the temple of his dwelling place. It is the living God, and he lives among us. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16 says this, and you are the temple of the living God. And as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. It is the living God. And as such, we are a living people. We're an active people, a vibrant people, a dynamic people, alive from dead in our sins and trespasses, but alive in Christ, alive to him. As is often the case, the true God, the living God, can be made practically dead by your lifeless and worthless acts of religion. We are to, are to embody a vibrant and an active faith. If our church fails to serve him, if our church fails to extol him, if our church fails to hallow his name, if our church fails to esteem his word, then in our lifeless and worthless acts of religion, we practically make the living God dead among us. And he is the living God. Church is not to be the frozen chosen. Church is not to be the congregation of dull hearts and dull minds. The church is a living, active organism that represents and extends the very life of God. Often this living is associated or points to God's judgment. The Bible says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, showing that God is capable and God will judge. It also says, beware, there must be, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Again, pointing to judgment. That illustration or that image begins in the Old Testament. Numbers 14, 28 says, As I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. It's an indication that God is capable of judgment and that God will certainly judge. But also that as I live, God often says as an expression of his promises, as an expression of his character, that you can take him at his, at his, at his word. As I live, says the Lord God. Also, living God implies the living nature of his work through the church the living nature of his rule and his reign in the church. It is the living quality of those that make up his body. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4 says, As he, that's Christ, is a living stone, we come to him also as living stones, being built up into a spiritual house. And we see that, obviously, in the way that the Lord organizes and structures and grows and develops his church. We are drawn to God, bound to him by covenant. However, in God binding us to himself by covenant, he also binds us with each other. It is both a vertical relationship with God and a horizontal relationship among God's people. We're bound to him also by covenant. And for an example of that, turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. The church of the living God is to be a serving, fervent, loving, working, laboring, toiling, evangelizing, thriving, healthy body. It is to be alive. 
is to be a living thing. Romans chapter 12, look beginning in verse 3. Here, again, this is how this works in the church. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. We're to be in a body where your grace that's been given to you, the gifts that have been given to you, that measure of faith that has been given to you is, been, is to be used and actively worked in the body for the good of the body. If prophecy, it says, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerful, cheerfulness. We're to put our gifts to work in the body. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, but fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing steadfastly in prayer. Distributing to the needs of the saints. Given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge. Does this sound like a body that is healthy, living, vibrant, thriving, serving the Lord, loving one another, obeying Christ? This is a picture in Scripture of a living faith that is associated with being in the house of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. The body is to be a living, thriving body, active at work. We can't say that that's the house in a nebulous way. That is you individually, me individually, that make up the church. We are the church. So how are you personally, how do you reflect the health and vibrancy of, of the church of the living God? How are you individually contributing to the health and fervency and vibrancy and spirituality of the church? Or are you hindering it? To the degree that you don't minister in the church with your grace and gifts that God has given you is to the degree that you hinder the work of the body because we are given to the body. The Lord puts us in the body with specific gifts and we're to use those in serving the body. Another example of this is 1 Corinthians 12. Turn there with me quickly. 1 Corinthians 12. Same concept. The Lord has formed the church. The identity of the church is constituted from its many parts being one body. It is the people of God knitted together, bound together, bind, bonded together, by the Lord for his purposes in the church. Chapter 12, verse 12. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and all have been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm a uh, hand, uh, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? The Lord has formed, structured, organized, the body placed you specifically in the body. Ephesians 4 says that he gives gifts to those in the church for the edifying of the saints, for the edifying of the body, but also for equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. But living, we're to be a living body, a thriving, healthy, serving, loving body. But a living church is also going to be growing. A living church is a growing body, the growing spiritually. Colossians chapter 2, verse 19 
says, All the body, nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. They grow. You individually are to grow in your maturity in Christ. You're to grow into Christ. We as a body are to grow in Christ. This should be a living, growing, healthy, thriving, serving, loving, vibrant body, right? If it is the church of the living God. There's so much more that could be said here. The Word of God is so deep on this issue. We could spend weeks and weeks on this one point. Uh, the church, the house of God, the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. It is a vast and deep well. And I love that about the Word of God. We look at this one verse in chapter 15. We just start explain, exploring what it means to be the house of God, what it looks like. And we could say so much more about what it means to be the house of the living God. There's just so much truth that is packed into that one phrase. It has so much meaning. But can you see that in pondering that, in thinking about that, in contemplating that, how that should motivate you, shouldn't it? to right conduct because of who you represent. You are a part of something so much greater than yourself. You are a part of something that represents God, the living God himself. And we're a part of that body. We have no value in and of ourselves aside from the value that is derived from God himself in creating us and then God himself in for loving us and choosing us to be his own special people his treasured possession, the apple of his eye, graven on his hand. Our value is completely wrapped up in that. And it should motivate a right response to correction, right? Right response to instruction, how we are to conduct ourselves in the house of God, the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. If you today are here and you belong to the people of God, does this, does it motivate you? Do you see the greatness and the glory of all that God has done in Christ for the church and how he has just magnificently just knit us together and formed us a redeemed people to worship him? That should motivate you. Now, your king, Christian, calls you to walk worthy of the calling with which you've been called, worthy of the king and worthy of his call. And your calling to the church is a high calling. But if you're here today, and you are not a Christian. Don't wait to come. You're either of the people of God or you are of your father, the devil. You are a son of God or a son of disobedience. Why would you wait? You can be the people of God who have an inheritance, eternal life to look forward to. Where your state apart from Christ, you have nothing to look forward to but hell, but destruction, but torment. Today is the day. Now is the time. Do not put it off. You put it off. You are just further hardened in the deceitfulness of your own sin. You keep putting it off. You will never come. You will never come. If you wait somehow thinking that you've got to get your life in order first, you'll never, ever come. Come now. It's the Lord of the church, our gracious and merciful heavenly Father that gives such good gifts to his children. If you'll come, if you'll leave your wicked life behind, because it is wicked, and follow Christ, and you'll praise the Lord with the heavenly people of God for all eternity, for his glory. It is a glorious thing. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord God, thank you for all that you have done in Christ. It is glorious in our sight. It is awesome to behold. I thank you for your infinite wisdom in instituting the church. And what a, an amazing thing the church is. The redeemed people of God, ransomed, blood-bought worshipers of Jesus Christ. A vibrant, healthy thriving reflection of you, our Lord, a testimony to this wicked world being swept away in the flood of their own debauchery on their way to hell. And yet you, glorious light set on the hill, 
God, thank you. Thank you for your church. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for our brothers and sisters. I thank you for your family. I pray, God, that we would walk worthy of the calling with which you've called us. That we, Lord, would be a healthy, thriving, serving, obeying, loving church. God, that you would protect us, Lord, from the deceitfulness of sin. God, that you would protect us from pride, protect us from lifeless, worthless, despicable religion. That we would be faithfully serving you, our King. God, that you would preserve us to the end. Lord, that you would, you would use us to further your work on the earth, to further your kingdom. Lord, use us to see souls saved, to gather in your people, the house of God. Lord, that you would use us for calling those that would be your worshipers. And then thank you for this glorious work. Thank you for the, the glorious privilege, God, the glorious blessing it is to be a part of your body, part of the church. God, I pray that you would lay on our hearts a feeling of weight with respect to the responsibility that we have uh, to your body and to your work. Thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name.